All right, welcome to our first screencast on chapter two. Now, chapter two is one of our most difficult, longest, and really more important chapters that we're going to cover this year because it covers chemistry, and everything that happens in a living thing is because of chemistry. And so we're really going to hit this chapter hard with some relatively good detail, and that should make everything else that we cover the rest of the year a little bit more uh, easier for you to understand. All right, now, chapter 2A really covers just basic chemistry and the chemistry of water. And this one's going to be broken up into five smaller podcasts. Now, this first one, or actually screencast, this first one is one of the pretty easy ones because it's going to be stuff that you should have known already. We're going to cover atomic structure. We're going to cover how you make different chemical bonds. And then we're going to cover the chemistry of water, why water gets to do all the neat things that it does. And then we're going to go over uh, parts of the or how the pH scale and acids and bases work. All right, so let's get down into the nitty-gritty of chemistry. So what is a, the basic unit of matter? Well, it's the atom. And the atom is made up of mainly three subatomic particles. Uh, number one would be the proton. Now, the proton has a positive charge. So if you just remember P for positive, uh, you're going to be able to understand this one. Now, this one weighs one atomic mass unit. These guys don't weigh very much, so we had to create our own special mass unit. You know, because you can't measure them in grams, you can't measure them in milligrams, because it comes out to be a really, really tiny number. And, and humans have a difficult time of understanding tiny, tiny numbers. So we just made up one, the atomic mass unit, and we gave it the weight of one, because people understand one real well. All right, the next atomic uh, or subatomic particle is the neutron. And if you look at the first five letters of neutron, it matches up with neutral because they have no charge, okay? Um, so this is what the zero over here means. It means it has no charge, it's, it's simply neutral. And it weighs the same as a proton, all right? The third subatomic particle is the electron. These guys have a negative charge, so we use the symbol E minus. And these guys weigh basically nothing, but they do weigh something. They weigh 1 1840th of an atomic mass unit. Now, if you can remember that these weigh basically nothing, so these really, really, really weigh nothing. And so for all in practical purposes, uh, the electron doesn't really have any mass, although it does have some. All right. So let's look at a, a Bohr's model of a uh, an atom. Okay. And this model was created by Niels Bohr's back in the first half of the 20th century. And it's really easy for us to understand. Think of like the nucleus as the sun, and the nucleus is made out of protons and neutrons, and then orbiting around it in these things called energy levels. So these can be called energy levels. That's an R right there. Okay. And these electrons are moving very, very fast. Uh, think of like planets going around the sun. Okay. And the farther you get away from the nucleus, the more energy you have. And the closer you get to the nucleus, the less energy that you have. You know, we have that in general. All right, so what subatomic particles are in a nucleus? As you saw in the previous graphics, protons and neutrons. Now, these guys have a positive charge, and these guys have no charge. So the overall charge of a nucleus is positive. Okay, so what subatomic particles are on the outside of the nucleus? Well, those are going to be your electrons. Now, electrons, remember, they have a negative charge, and they're constantly moving, and they're going to move in orbits. Remember those little, you know, just basically orbitals that we saw going around in that previous graphic, but we really call those energy levels. All right, so if we're going to redraw, let's redraw it here. Okay, so there's our nucleus. Let's pick a different color. There we go. Let's just use red. Okay, so we're going to put our electrons on the outside. And in this case, we've got two energy levels. Now, in reality, these are perfect circles. I'm just not talented enough to do it. Okay, so in the first energy level, we got two electrons. Okay, and then the outer, this next energy level, we can actually hold up to eight. And these electrons have a tendency to basically spread themselves out as evenly as possible. All right, so this energy level here, this one has more energy. So just a big E for energy. And then this one on the inside has less. Now, they both have a lot of energy. We're just being relative to each other. The farther away from the nucleus you get, the more energy that you have, okay? And these electrons can sometimes move back and forth between energy levels. But we'll, we'll talk about that in a different part. 
uh, uh, sometime in this uh, school school year when we get to some of these more detailed screencasts. All right. All right. So what's an element? An element is a pure substance that's made up of only one kind of atom. Okay. Now you guys have all seen the periodic table in a science book. Uh, in our book, I think it's towards the back. Okay. It'll be in one of the appendixes or appendices, I should say. And as you can see here, this um, basically graphic right here shows you um, what it would look like in a periodic table. And this one happens to be carbon with its chemical symbol of C. So every element's going to have a one or two letter symbol. And this top one up here, that's going to be your atomic number. And the atomic number shows you the number of protons. And if the atom is neutral, it's going to show you the number of electrons. Okay, basically, remember, positives and negatives for math. If you have three positives and you have three negatives, that's a comes out to zero. So that would be a neutral atom. Okay, uh, This number 12 down here, that is going to be your mass number. And the mass number is going to give you the number of protons and neutrons. Okay, Basically, it's giving you the weight of the nucleus. So how do I figure out how many neutrons I have? Well, first of all, if I take the mass number and I subtract the atomic number from it, that's what I'm going to get. So in this case with carbon, the mass number is 12. Now, we're going to talk about why it has a 0.01 here in just a little bit, but we're just going to consider it 12. And then we subtract the number of protons, which in this case is 6, because that's its atomic number. We'll figure out that it's got six neutrons. All right? So very simple math on how to figure that out. Okay, This 0.01 comes from the fact that not every single uh, atom of carbon is going to actually have six neutrons. Sometimes it's going to have seven. Sometimes it's going to be eight. And we call those isotopes. And we're going to talk about those guys next. All right, so what is an isotope? An isotope is an atom of an element with an unusual number of neutrons. And so in other words, if it's carbon, it doesn't have six. Now, isotopes are usually pretty rare. Um, the regular non-isotope is the more common form of this element, but occasionally there can be an extra neutron or two in there. Okay, now these guys are identified by their mass numbers. So you would have something like a carbon 13, a carbon 14. Now they do have the same chemical properties. When we talk about chemical properties, we're talking about how it makes chemical bonds. Okay, And these chemical bonds always use electrons. So because it has a normal number of electrons, it can still make the same kind of chemical bonds that you're used to seeing. All right? So in this graphic, you're going to be able to see here that you have carbon 12, which is normal. Okay, and what we have here is the red ones are the new are the neutrons. So I'm gonna put it in there, and then P for the purple ones. So this is carbon 12, regular normal carbon, six protons, six neutrons, six electrons. So it would be a neutral atom. Over here we have carbon 13. We've got seven neutrons. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. All right, now notice that we still had six protons, we still had six electrons, so it's still gonna be a neutral atom, but it just has an extra neutron. Now over here at carbon 14, we've got eight neutrons, and this is the one that happens to be radioactive. And we're gonna use this one in often used in dating fossils and whatnot, okay? All right, so what can we use these radioactive isotopes for? Well. In order to be radioactive, you have to have a, a nucleus that will decay over time. And what that means is that that nucleus is going to fall apart. It's going to break in half. And so, you know, it's not going to be carbon anymore. In the case of carbon-14, it's going to end up being two new elements. Now, not new elements that we've never seen before. It may de decay into, like, a hydrogen atom or a sulfur atom or, or you know, something like that. All right. Now, what can we use radioactive is isotopes for? Well, we can use those for dating fossils. Now, that doesn't mean you're taking the, uh, a rock or a fossil to a dinner and a movie on a date. That just means you're trying to figure out what the age of it is. And what you do is you take into account how fast it takes it for to decay. You just use some simple math. Okay. Uh, they can be used to treat cancers and kill bacteria. 
These radioactive isotopes that are used to kill bacteria, we typically see these in rather large food institutions such as a, a food factory or a really, really, really large kitchen. Um, more common to you guys would be for treating cancers, typically brain cancers, because those are very difficult to, to operate on. So they can shoot that part of the brain with uh, radiation and kill those cancer cells. Okay, now we've already seen this one. When we're talking about chapter one. When we were doing the Hershey and Chase experiment, now remember, Griffith figured out that bacteria can transform it. Hershey and Chase, they were trying to figure out if Avery's hypothesis that DNA was a transforming factor was correct or not. And what they did is they labeled uh, protein with a sulfur tracer, in other words, a radioactive form of sulfur. And then they also labeled uh, some DNA in the next step of the experiment with a radioactive form of phosphorus. And they could see the radioactive isotope move in because it'll, it'll glow. They can pick it up using film and that kind of stuff. It will glow and they can see if the DNA went inside or if it stayed outside or if the protein stayed outside or moved inside. And they found out that it was DNA that moved in. All right. Okay, now that will conclude uh, our first screencast from Chapter 2A on basic chemistry and uh, isotopes, mass number, etc. All right. So make sure you're keeping up on your studies. And until next time, we'll catch you later.